Good morning, everyone, and good morning to everyone online. This morning, we'll be continuing with the uh, study we've been doing on the kings of Judah. We've heard about Saul, the first king. We've heard about David, the great king. We've heard about Solomon, the wise king, although I don't think anybody with 700 mothers-in-law is very wise, but that's another matter. Today we're going to talk about Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, who followed him on the throne. But just a little bit that will make more sense as we go through. Solomon had departed from strictly following the ways of the Lord, mainly as a result of his infatuation with foreign women. And of course they introduced pagan gods who Solomon also started to worship. And then the prophet Ahijah prophesied to Jeroboam, who was one of Solomon's uh, administrators, that he would be king over ten tribes. The rest would remain with Solomon. Now Solomon found out and he sought to dispose of Jeroboam, so he did the wise thing and took off to Egypt. In 1 Kings 11, verses 36, 35 and 36, we read, But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and give it to you, ten tribes. And to his son I will give one tribe that my servant David may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem the city which I have chosen for myself to put my name there. <clears throat> and then in the same chapter, Kings 11, verse 43, Then Solomon rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David his father, and Rehoboam his son reigned in his place. Okay, so let's have a quick look at... Uh, Rehoboam the king. Oh, vibrator. Here it is. He was the son of Solomon. His mother, Neymar, and that name means pleasant, was an Ammonite. So this is one of Solomon's foreign women. He was the last king of the united Israel and the first king of the southern kingdom of Judah. Although Judah actually encompassed the tribe of Benjamin and some of the tribe of Simeon as well and most of the Levites lived in Judah. So it's more than just the tribe of Judah but that was their land. He was 41 when he came to the throne. He ruled for 17 years, so he was 58 when he fell off the perch. His name means expansion of the people, but it was the exact opposite that happened. So what about Rehoboam the man? Even at 41 years of age, he was immature, he was arrogant. To me, he's pictured as a spoiled brat, always wanting his own way and apparently hungry for power. He lacked wisdom and had little concern for the people he was to rule. Rehoboam, like the, his father and his grandfather, was a polygamist but he didn't match his father in that regard. He only had 18 wives and 60 concubines, 28 sons and 60 daughters. The wives who are mentioned by name in the scripture were all Israelites from the royal family. They were not heathen women. 
And then the next one, we'll talk about his accession ceremony. David had ruled Judah and Benjamin for seven years before being accepted as king by the ten northern tribes. His acceptance by the north took place at Shechem. So in effect, there were two coronations. It would seem, although not explicitly stated, that Solomon had followed the same practice. And Rehoboam now follows the same practice and he goes to Shechem to meet with the northern tribes. And this is where we'll start reading from 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 1 to 15. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. So it happened when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard it and he was still in Egypt remember he fled to Egypt to escape the wrath of Solomon for he had fled from the presence of King Solomon had been dwelling in Egypt that they sent and called him then Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam saying your father made our yoke heavy now therefore Lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke which he put on us and we will serve you. So he said to them, Depart for three days, then come back to me. And the people departed. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who stood before his father Solomon while he still lived and he said, How do you advise me to answer these people? And they spoke to him, saying, If you will be a servant to these people today and serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. This is the servant leadership that was exhibited by Jesus. He came to serve. And a servant leader is always one who is concerned about his people, his employees, and always concerned with providing them with the resources that they need to do their job. It's a whole different way of saying, I'm the top ape in the tree, therefore you'll do what I say. The traditional leadership or corporate structure is like a pyramid. You've got Donald Trump at the top and everybody else underneath. But servant leadership inverts that. The servant leader is at the bottom and he provides the resources for everybody to do their job. And that's what the advice was from Solomon's advisors. So they were obviously pretty wise people as well. So what does Rehoboam do? But he rejected the advice which the elders had given him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him, who stood before him. And he said to them, What advice do you give? How should we answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Lighten the yoke which your father put on us? Then the young men who had grown up with him spoke to him, saying, Thus you should speak to this people who have spoken to you, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. And now, whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had directed, saying, Come back to me the third day. Then the king answered the people roughly and rejected the advice which the elders had given him. And he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. 
My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. So the king did not listen to the people, for the turn of events was from the Lord, that he might fulfill his word, which the Lord had spoken by Ahijah the Shilionite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. This is all the Lord's work. But that doesn't excuse the human behaviour. Rehoboam had gone to Shechem to be acknowledged as king. When Jeroboam heard of the death of Solomon, he returned. And he also went to Shechem, along with the representatives. They say all the men of Israel, well, I mean, <laughs> they wouldn't all be there, but there would be a fair representation from each of the ten tribes. They delivered him an ultimatum. Why had Solomon made everything so hard for them? I mean, he was a very wealthy man. He was also a very wise man, so we're told. But to maintain the oriental opulence of his court, Solomon had used forced labour and he taxed the people heavily. So they were saying, in effect, lower the taxes with which your father oppressed us and we will serve you. Otherwise, we will revolt. That's what they were saying, in effect. He asked for three days to think it over. And, of course, we know what the advice was. The oldies said, speak to them nicely. Give them a little bit of what they want and they'll serve you. And now he wanted to listen to the young men because they spoke to him what he desired. See, what he was listening to was not what he needed to hear, but what he wanted to hear. There's a big difference. The advice that was given was naive and inflammatory. And the show of strength, which it was supposed to be, actually concealed weakness. Rehoboam turned his back on Solomon's wisdom and the fate of the kingdom was sealed. The people of Israel revolted against him, although some were still living in the territory of Judah. And then 1 Kings 12, verses 16 to 24, tells us about the divided kingdom. Now when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, saying, What share have we in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now see to your own house, O David. So Israel departed to their tents. Rehoboam reigned over the children of Israel who dwelt in the cities of Judah. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was in charge of the revenue. But Israel stoned him with stones and he died. Why would you send the guy who was your chief tax collector and in charge of the forced labour to go up and talk to them. Yeah, I mean, that's not wisdom. They'd have hated him. Ah, here's our persecutor. And he got stoned. So Israel has been in rebellion against the... Um, yeah. They've been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. Now it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had come back, they sent for him and called him to the congregation and made him king over all Israel, which of course fulfills the prophecy of Ahijah that we read earlier. There was none who followed the house of David but the tribe of Judah only. And when Rehoboam came to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 chosen men who were warriors to fight against the house of Israel. 
that he might restore the kingdom to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. But the word of God came to Shemaiah, a man of God, saying, Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the rest of the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, You shall not go up nor fight against your brethren and the children of Israel. Let every man return to his house, for this thing is from me. Therefore they obeyed the word of the Lord and turned back according to the word of the Lord. Rehoboam planned war on Israel. But at least this time he did have the wisdom to listen to the word of the Lord from the prophet. And he didn't carry out with his plans. He ignored the counsel of the elders, but he wasn't quite game to ignore the counsel of the Lord. And I think that spared many, many lives on both sides. The word of the Lord had decreed the split and the word of the Lord ensured that the division was without bloodshed. So let's just have a quick review. Power-hungry Rehoboam tried to flex his political muscle more than he desired to connect with his people. Bad move. He really needed to be other-minded, think of others, and his bully boy tactics earned him only contempt and he lost the ten tribes. He was young, 41, they used to still call him a lad. He was 41, he was young, cocky, unteachable, and he destroyed the nation. You know, there's nothing more dangerous than ignorance and arrogance. That is a combination which causes untold trouble. Leaders must always connect with their people. The people, they wanted a leader who would listen, and he didn't. People will follow a leader who will always listen to their concerns and respond with empathy. You see, human beings have the freedom to be obedient or disobedient. In other words, to act wisely or to act foolishly. But this freedom is always contained within God's sovereignty. And the events announced by his prophets always come about. Now there are prophecies in the Bible which didn't happen because they were not from the Lord. They were false prophets. But from the word of the Lord, from the prophet of the Lord, always came about. Although sometimes there was quite a span of time between the prophecy and its fulfilment, but it always comes about. God says what he means, he means what he says, and he will do what he says. The fulfilment of the prediction of Ahijah affords an instance, similar to many others in, in, in the scripture, of prophecies being accompanied by human passions and, you might say, in the natural course of events. Men think they're obeying their own wills and carrying out their own plans unconscious that the matter is of God and permitted and overruled by him for the performance of his word. Meanwhile, Jeroboam in the north plunged the northern kingdom into gross idolatry, causing those priests and Levites who were loyal to the Lord to flee to Judah. And they were followed by all the northerners who had a heart after the Lord. 
so in that way, Rehoboam's kingdom was strengthened because it cost them everything to go to Jerusalem. They left behind their common lands, their possessions, and their friends because they were faithful to the Lord. And they went down to Judah. They wouldn't stay in the northern kingdom. Jeroboam said uh, to stop the people in the north from going down to Jerusalem for the feasts of the Lord, he erected two shrines, one at Bethel and one at Dan, and they worshipped golden calves. And he appointed his own priests to carry out the various things. So they were well and truly into idolatry. So what did Rehoboam do in his reign in Judah? Is that the next one? Much of the king's time was spent in building cities for the defence of Judah. And the fortified cities located south of Jerusalem showed that he feared an attack from Egypt. And his fears were well founded. In 1 Kings 14, 22 to 24, Now Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they committed more than all that their fathers had done. For they also built for themselves high places, sacred pillars, and wooden images on every high hill and under every green tree. This again is going back to the Canaanite gods, They were agricultural gods, but they were also fertility gods. And the worship of those gods involved sexual orgies and ritual sexual uh, practice with prostitutes, and that was supposed to be the form of worship. That's what they talk. Whenever you see any mention there of high places, that's what they're talking about. And there were also perverted persons in the land. That, to me, would suggest that there was uh, homosexuality. Now, we're starting to look towards Sodom again, aren't we? Perverted persons in the land. They did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. One of their big problems when they went in, the Lord said to them when they went into the land of Israel, wipe out everybody, cleanse the land, kill all the people, men, women and children. That sounds cruel, but it was to cleanse the land so there was no way that the people of Israel would be infected by the false worship of the Canaanite tribes but they didn't wipe them all out they allowed some to live with them in some cases they even intermarried with them and so the Canaanite religion was not cleansed totally from the land and it rears its ugly head all the time Satan never lets anything lie does he Give him an inch, he'll take a mile. And that's what was happening. So whereas 1 Kings 14, 22 to 24 mentions some of the details of Rehoboam's apostasy, Chronicles 12 simply says that he forsook the law of the Lord and did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. Now five short years after the powerful monarch Solomon had died, The Egyptians are at Jerusalem's gates to carry away her treasures. His fortified cities didn't do him any good. Shishak, who was the uh, pharaoh of Egypt, subdued Judah, not because of Egypt's military superiority, 
but because of Judah's unfaithfulness to Jehovah. That was the root cause of all their trouble. Unfaithfulness to the Lord. In 2 Chronicles 12, 5 to 9 we read, Shemaiah the prophet came to Rehoboam and the leaders of Judah who were gathered together in Jerusalem because of Shishak and said to them, Thus says the Lord, You have forsaken me, therefore I have also left you in the hands of Shishak. So the leaders of Israel and the king humbled themselves and they said, The Lord is righteous. So there's a repentance of sorts. Now when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah saying, They have humbled themselves, therefore I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverance. My wrath shall not be poured out on Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. Nevertheless, they will be his servants that they may distinguish my service from the service of the kingdoms of the nations. In other words, I'll give you a taste of what it's like to live under somebody else's uh, rulership instead of mine. So Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took everything. He also carried away the gold shields which Solomon had made. So, Shemaiah has delivered a prophecy of doom. And the kings of the princes, they humble themselves. And it was through the Lord's mercy and grace that they received deliverance of sorts, but not without a painful lesson on the difference between serving the Lord and serving their captors. Rehoboam tried to adjust as much as possible and he instituted bronze shields for gold, unwittingly illustrating that God's presence and favour, which is represented by the gold, were being replaced by his judgment, the bronze. The story of Rehoboam concludes with the statement, he did evil and rested with his fathers. The difference between Rehoboam and his grandfather David can be seen by comparing Psalm 27, 8, where David says, When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, Lord, I will seek. And if you compare that, David sought the Lord's face, Rehoboam did not. And 2 Chronicles 12, 14 says, And he did evil because he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. Now that's a lesson for us, isn't it? Prepare our hearts to seek the Lord. So what about Rehoboam as a leader? That's the next one. He was a dysfunctional leader, in plain language, a lousy leader. His arrogance, his hunger for power, his unreasonable demands, his poor decision-making and lack of compassion for those who worked under him all conspired to doom his leadership. And the fact that he listened to the wrong people didn't help. On the next uh, slide, I point out that listening skills is an indispensable quality of a leader for two reasons. To connect with others and to learn from others. A good leader encourages his followers to tell him what he needs to know, not what he wants to hear. And over the years I've experienced that. You find that quite a lot in large corporations and certainly in the public service and I would suggest very often the uh, political ministers. They don't want to listen to what they need to hear, they want to listen to what they want to hear. 
and that can create a lot of problems. There's also, I suppose you can call it a theory of leadership, called the inner circle. And it's on the next one. A good leader develops an inner circle of solid people of integrity who possess these qualities. Experience. They've been down the road of life or they've been in the organisation and uh, been through the highs and lows. They've got experience and they understand what the road of life or what that organisation is all about. They have a heart for God. Those who place God first and uphold his values. Objectivity. They can see the pros and cons of each situation and they're able to weigh them up. Pros and cons meaning what's for it, what's against it. It's all the what ifs. If this happens, if that happens. They can think their way through things. They have a love for people. They love others and value them more than things. And if you're talking about an organisation, you're talking about employees. They think about their employees. Complementary gifts. People who bring diverse skills and abilities to the relationship. Some people think that because you're the boss, you're supposed to know everything, be able to do everything and solve everything. And that may not be so. A good manager recognises skills in other people that when those skills are put to use, they make him look good. But jealousy gets in the way. And very often they see somebody who has those qualities as being a threat. And that was Rehoboam's problem. He saw all these elder statesmen as being a threat to him because they, they weren't telling him what he wanted to hear. They were telling him what he needed to hear. So he listened to his, the young guys that grew up with him. And loyalty to the leader. People who truly love, respect and are concerned for the leader. It's complimentary. If you love and respect those you lead, they will love, respect and be loyal to you. Rehoboam had all of that available to him in his father's counsellors but he chose to listen to those said what he wanted to hear because that reinforced his own opinions. There's a difference between hearing and listening. Hearing is hearing the words. That's a function of the ears. Listening is a function of the will. It's hearing the meaning of the words with understanding and compassion. Rehoboam heard but didn't listen. That's a problem with most husbands, isn't it? It certainly is with me. I hear the words. I don't always understand what's being said. Why are the women smiling? He also failed. That's the next one, Sammy, thanks. Because he had a narrow vision. The people promised to serve him if he lightened their load and he didn't see it. He didn't see that he had a way out of this problem. He had poor decision making skills. He wavered on what to do about their request. He said, oh, come back later. Three, come back in three days. Couldn't make a decision. And he had a very self-centred focus. He rejected wise counsel because it didn't match his desires. And he had a demanding and impatient style. His arrogance made him promise to make things tougher and not easier for them. In other words, I'm the king, I'm the boss, you'll do what I say. 
And whatever I lay on you, you'll wear it. And of course they didn't. Now there are lessons there for a leader in any form of organisation, whether it's a church, a business enterprise or a bureaucratic organisation. Those lessons are there for all of us. And I would suggest, and this is just thinking about things now, I'm talking to myself as much as anything, there's probably lessons for husbands in the way we lead our households too. Listen to your wives because they've often got some good ideas. If you're an employer, listen to your employees because they have to do the job. They know better ways of doing things that you would never even conceive because they've got to do the job. Anyway, I'll leave a stop at that. But I think you can see from that how Rehoboam was a lousy leader. He lost the ten northern tribes because of that. Arrogance. Unteachability. Listening to what he wanted to hear, not what he needed to hear. Ignoring wise counsel. But at least he did, on one occasion, have the sense to listen to the word of the Lord. But that still didn't stop him from going down the path of apostasy and into idolatry. So eventually, his rule was the exact opposite of Solomon and David. They weren't perfect, but they were much better in what they did. Anyway, you keep those thoughts in mind. Have a great day.